and every one. such a blessing to be as we wait in the congregation. I want to thank the elders for the gracious presentation the time and the part of your summer series. We were thrilled to have David with us at East Ridge last Wednesday night. David did a great, great job. Talk about the song of God's table. David just opened that song up to our understanding our appreciation. David, we love you. You are a great example for this church, for all of us to know you. We love you and your church. I've been at East Ridge, as one brother said a moment ago, almost forever, back to the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Actually, we've been there 40 years. We celebrated our 40th year of work, beginning our 40th, 41st year of work. We've had Neil and Teresa Brooks, our women, who have been there several years. People like Neil and Teresa that helped us preachers to stay in one place. It was a great, great service to the Lord. We love them. We love all of you. And you are truly a blessing in my life. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. We can share together. But I believe one of the great, great sermons ever preached. No way, absolutely no way, I can preach this by the guy in here. We were asked in getting our lesson for this summer series to take a preacher in the past and get one of his lessons to share it with the summer city. Diane Woods is known for his scholarship. He's known for his soundness. He's known for his great, great ability to help all of us understand the Word of God in a better way. I don't know how many of you in the audience here tonight ever heard Brother Woods preached. Would you raise your hands if you heard Brother Guy in Woods preach? We have several of you here that have had that blessing. When I was a teenager back in Valdosta, Georgia, worshiping at the Forest Park congregation, 
down there. Brother Woods came and held a gospel meeting there. My mother and dad had the blessing of having him in our home for a meal. So as a teenager, I remember meeting and being around and associated with Brother Woods. Kind, gentle, very, very convicted in what he believed in. Shows tonight a lesson. But I believe challenges all of us in our thinking. The lesson that Brother Wood preached, and I'll just highlight a lot of what he said. Now, I'm not going to begin reading from the first sentence all the way down to the end of his lesson because there are 25 pages in that lesson. And if you start walking out about the middle of the lesson, I'll understand we've gone too long. I'll just try to highlight the things that Brother Diane Wood shared regarding shall we know one another in heaven. I believe that the question that all of us have is the question of what lies beyond the door of death. That's right over there. One reason I believe the Bible to be God's inspired, inerrant word is that it does not cater to our curiosity. Wouldn't you like to be able to interview Lazarus? Been dead four days. Was over on the other side in the Hadean realm. And there he saw some things, experienced some things, that if we were to sit down and we were to talk with him, Lazarus, what did you find over there? What did you see? What did you feel? What did you experience when you walked through the doors of death? What about the widow of Nain, son, whom Jesus raised? From the day, his lips are sealed. Nothing in the scripture is revealed about what that widow of Nain's son experienced beyond the door of death. What about when the witch of Endor called up old Samuel? Samuel had been dead, and he came back from the dead. And as Saul was communicating with Samuel that, or words of Samuel said, why did you call me up? But there was nothing said by Samuel about what he experienced beyond death. What about Eutychus? Eutychus died when he fell out the window during Paul's preaching. That was only a short time that he died and experienced what the ethics was. But there's nothing, nothing in the scriptures that Judas has said as a young man what he experienced beyond the The door is closed. So I don't know why. But I do know that the Bible says in the book of 2 Timothy 1 at verse number 10 that life and immortality are brought to light through the gospel. And all that we need to know, all that is revealed in the gospel about life and immortality are words I believe that stir within us the greatest desire and the deepest longing to be able someday to walk through those doors of death there to experience things that we cannot imagine. It might be that we will say, I am thankful that I really get to know all that there is to know about death 
what lies beyond it. Because you see, now I can see it and experience it. First thing, far better. I had a good day. A lot of folks tonight has been a word of Brother Wood, and I'll go back and forth with the personal observations that I've done already, but also some observations from Brother Wood. He quotes from the noted unbeliever Robert Ingersoll, who did not believe in afterlife, who believed that death ended everything. And Ingersoll stood the grave of his brother and uttered words of hopelessness of what he thought lies beyond this life. And he would say it's like someone crying out, wondering what's on the other side. And from the lips of the silent dead, there comes no response. There comes no answer from those who have gone beyond this line. He said these in the closing words of a statement that Brother Wood did. Ingersoll said, Life is a narrow veil between the cold and barren beach, beach of two eternities. We strive in vain to look beyond the heights. Cry aloud. The only answer is the echo of our wailing cry. From the voiceless lips of the unrepining dead, there comes no word. We know this is our From the lips of the one who died. That Sunday morning was resurrected. He gives us the word of assurance. He gives us the word of promise and hope. And while we are looking for the answer of what lies beyond, and those of our loved ones who have left us long ago, or maybe even recently, while they cannot answer, while they cannot give us a word, we have the word of Jesus through the gospel about life and immortality, the helplessness of unbelief. Something that none of us embrace in our heart tonight, the despair of those who draw the curtain of inspiration and they refuse to regard the lessons which it alone teach, which it alone reveals to us. For the words of Brother Wood say, encourage and strengthen our hearts and solidify our faith. Philosophy of men tonight regarding even the very nature of what the death is for the wood in his powerful presentation said that there are those who do not even believe in the reality of death. There's no such thing as dying. There's no such thing as death. Death is just the imagination out of one's experience. Such is taught by the false religion of Christian science. Others in the realm of materialism declare that all there is of man goes away when he dies. There's nothing that is left of man. Death is complete. Dissolution occurs when we think about dying and the experience thereof. The materialist says that when death comes to us, the wood says that there are a lot of folks who look at death and dying for the wrong reason. That the dying experience is because of maybe some personal sin or error in one's life. And the occasion of suffering and death is because of the fact that 
there is some sin in my personal life that brings about this suffering, that brings about this moment of death. Yes, we understand and we know that death came through the door of sin. And when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, then they brought the reality of death into being. Why do we die? Because man sinned in the beginning. And when man and woman brought sin into the world, when they brought them into the garden, they were separated from God. They died spiritually that day. And ultimately they died physically. And the wages and the price that all of us know is the result of sin is death. They are things as a black cloud over our world tonight. And death is there because of sin. But you and I cannot look at personal things in our lives or personal experiences and say, I am going to die this moment or I suffer today because of some particular sin as a result. Bringing forth the reality of death. We know that there are things that we do that may hasten death. Someone can become a drunkard, yet in their vehicle drive down the road and have a terrible accident, and then they hasten to bring about their death because of personal choice of sin. There are other sins that people may become guilty of that bring about the reality of death. But remember the words that Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. Now, there were some present at that very season who told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered and said unto them, Think ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered these things? I tell you, nay. It wasn't because of the greater sin that brought about the suffering. You remember how that in John the ninth chapter, the Bible there reveals that the disciples see a man who is blind, and he was blind from birth. And they said, Master, who did sin, this man, for his parents that he was born blind? Now remember the words of the Savior. Jesus said, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Thus our Lord tells us that it's not because of sins of parents or the individual or that we are suffering because of what we've done necessarily in our lives, that death is the consequence. So we know that there is the guilt of sin, but there's also the consequence of sin. And if we could distinguish between the two, or well, the word says that we could understand really what death and why it has been brought about in our world. Adam's sin brought death upon the race. And we suffer its consequence. The guilt of Adam's sin was not passed upon us. But the consequence of Adam's sin was passed upon the human race as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. Even so we see the consequences. There are also those that look at personal problems and sufferings and they attribute their sufferings and the personal problems of their lives to some kind of personal transgression. And they say, what have I done? Why am I suffering this way? Is God's hand a punishment upon me tonight? Is God bringing about suffering because of some sin in my life? We know that the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. And all the things you see that are associated with the dying process comes upon all of us. We don't know. From one day to the next, what will be the result of what will bring about death? What will bring about the hastening or 
the quickening of death for some and how the son may live even longer. But we know, do know this, that we are still tonight as children of God for the hope, the assurance we have through Christ Jesus and it is not some personal sin that necessarily has hastened our sickness and our ultimate death. Brother Woods quoted beautiful poem, and you may be familiar with this, by John Greenleaf Whittier, The Eternal Tribute. Within the maddening maze of things, and tossed by storm and flood, to one fixed trust, my spirit clings. I know that God would. I know not what the future has of marvel or surprise, assured alone that life and death, His mercy. Underlying, so beside the silence, I wait the muffled pour. No harm from him can come to me on ocean or on shore. I know not where his islands lift their fonded palms in air. I only know I cannot drift beyond. His love and care and thou, O Lord, by whom are seen thy creatures as they be, forgive me if too close I lean my human heart on thee. Beautiful words on that. Expressing us all of the past in the midst of our suffering. The approaching moment of leaving this world and death, we know, we know, that hour we're in the hand of loving God and Father of us all. The second question, and we to rush through this now to get to the question that I've asked, shall we recognize one another in heaven? But I'm trying to get through what Brother Woods has shared in this great lesson. Brother Woods asked, in the second place, well, what exactly is death? What do you mean by dying and what's it all about? Brother Wood said there is no easy definition. How do you define what is life? How do we understand life itself? What's it all about? What's living all about? What is life within us? What is death? Well, he goes to the dictionary. Brother Wood pulls up these definitions. Life. Life is a vital force. Existence. A way or manner of living. And death is the loss of life. The state of being dead. Cessation of existence. Hard to understand, isn't it? And how do we pull our minds around the idea? As Brother Wood said, these definitions from the dictionary are inadequate. What we need to do is go and see exactly what does God's Word tell us. Has God revealed anything in the sacred Word that helps us understand what death truly is? And Brother Wood said that when we turn to the only source of information about life and death found in the Bible from its pages then, even the most humble and obscure person can learn regarding what earthly life is and what death, even beyond and above the wisest philosophers, we may understand what death and life are all about. You remember in the book of James, chapter 2, there is this very simple, easy to understand verse. James, the half brother of Jesus, said, As the body, apart from the spirit, is dead. 
by definition and deduction, we can discover that life is the state or condition which exists while the body and the spirit are united. As long as I have spirit in my body, I have life in this body. Life is this union of the body and the spirit which God has given to us. Death is the separation of the spirit that leaves the body. And once the spirit leaves the body, the body then becomes dead. But the spirit does not die. The spirit, as it leaves the body, the spirit goes into the Hadean way. The child of God, the glory and the blessing of that spirit going in the paradise, into Abraham's bosom. And the one that then who has died physically, that body, that flesh which is cold and lifeless, with no sounds from the voice, with the eyes closed in death, with the ears shut from the sounds all around, the body has died. The body has no life within. Because the spirit has left that body that exactly defines what death is all about. It is a separation. A separation of the spirit from the body. And that great separation is the death that occurs when our spirit leaves and departs from God who gave it. The body simply goes to sleep. The quality of that body is resting, awaiting. Coming of the Savior who will pierce every grave with a shout comes forth, and every body inside the grave shall rise to live forever as the Spirit comes back into that body and is raised. Over there and the dead. In the latter part of Brother Wood's collection, I'm not in the latter part of that, but I'm in the But in the latter part of Brother Wood's collection, he shared something that is extremely interesting. Have you ever thought about how long Abraham has been dead? What about all the other patriarchs and the great servants of God in the Old Testament age, David and, and other great men of God and how long they have slumbered in the grave, how long they have been there. And we wonder, have they experienced all the length and the long, long millennium of years that have gone on from all the way back to the moment they died? All the way down till tonight. All the way down till Jesus comes again. Are they experiencing all of those long years? Brother Wood says this, you know, when you go to sleep and you dream, those dreams may last for a period of time. It seem like a month. Like a short time. When you go to sleep tonight, they sleep for eight hours. It really doesn't seem like eight hours, does it? We just sleep and we awaken in the morning and we really are not cognizant of the time that we have spent asleep during the night. And Brother Wood said, it is certainly possible that all of those who are asleep, their bodies are asleep in the grave, 
their spirits are over there in the Hadean realm. There is no time in the Hadean realm. There is no going around the sun. There are no days and nights, seasons and years, minutes and hours, weeks and months. There is no such thing as time beyond this life in the eternal realm. So is it possible that it may only seem as a moment of time that when we go to sleep in this body and Jesus comes again, to us it may only seem like a short period of time. Even so with Abraham and all the righteous redeemed of Old Testament days, to them it may only seem as a short period of time, not long millenniums of time. I think that is a very challenging thought. Because you see, when this body is asleep, it only seems in the tomb to be just for a little time. It will only appear to be a little while when we leave this body. The spirit of war summons us forth from the dead. What a place. The thing about death it is that our uh, separation is to be to the moment of death is spirit from the body. The Bible says in Genesis. Verse 8, and Abraham gave up the ghost, died in a good old age, an old man, and full of years. Genesis chapter 35, verse 18, describes us the death of Rachel. Came to pass that her soul was departed. She died. Verse King 17, verse 22. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came in the end of the day. Psalm 90 and verse 10. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Acts 7 verse 59. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What then does the Bible say these folks experience when they die? Gave up the ghost. The soul comes back into the body. We fly away. As Stephen would say, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. It is thus that attitude and that wonderful understanding of the separation of the spirit. When we ask, does the spirit survive apart from the body? Brother Wood says that he is being absolutely sure that the spirit survives the death of the body and that spirit is a conscious entity. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8. The Apostle Paul wrote, Being therefore always of good courage, and knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We're willing rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. Look at it now. Listen to what Paul is saying. Absent from the body, the spirit leaving the body, and when that spirit is absent from the body, it goes to be at home with the Lord. It goes into an existence of continuation of life. It goes and it continues to exist beyond this life. Now we get down to the question. What time am I supposed to stop? About 10 till, is that right? Will I hear a bell? Will somebody come and drag me out? I don't know exactly what time we stop. Because I've got to get down to what you really want to know. Brother Woods laid all these things out, and, and to be fair to Brother Woods, I need to share those things that he prefaced this question about shall we know one another in heaven? Will I know? Will I recognize those who I'm experienced relationships, my wife, my children, my 
father, my brother, my brother, my sister, all of you. Is that the day? I'll try to hurry. I got what? 30 more minutes? Oh, five more minutes. Okay. Hold on. Listen. If I talk fast, you might be listening slow. So be sure you catch what I say. I really believe with all of my heart to summarize all that Brother Wood would say in the last five minutes or so of this lesson. Brother Wood said, There is within the heart of everyone. Going all the way back to those who were not even Bible believers, those who were philosophers of ancient days like Socrates, he would talk about an unspeakable joy of being able to see people on the other side that we have known on this side. And there are other philosophers, others, who have said that it is only reason within the heart. All of us have that desire that once we walk away from that mound of clay, once we have said goodbye to that one that we love more than life itself, once we have walked away from those whom we have buried and we have left, for anyone to believe that is a final goodbye. We will never see them again in the life to come. And if we see them, we will not know who they are. We will not recognize who they are. Oh, that is not, my friend, that is not what I read in my Bible. My Bible clearly, without any equivocation or shadow of a doubt, my Bible says, when I leave this life, those on the other side whom I've known in this life, I will recognize who they are. You say, well, they're spirit beings. How are you going to recognize a spirit being? Remember now, it's not just some kind of ghost or some kind of spirit thing that maybe children think of when they think of little spirits or ask for the ghost or all those things. No, that's not what the Bible is saying about our spirit nature beyond this life. You know what we will have beyond this life. You and I will have a resurrected B-O-D-Y. We will have a body. Yes, it will be an immortal body. It will be an incorruptible body. But I believe it will be a recognizable body. It will be ways that you and I will see those who have gone before us that somehow or another we will recognize who they are. Someone may wonder, what about a little baby that's born? What about a little child, six or seven years of age? And you lose that loved one when you were young. Are you going to be able to recognize what is that six-year-old? What is that little baby going to look like? I'll leave that in the hands of God. The secret things belong to the Lord. Those things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Is it possible? Is it just possible that little baby, that little six-year-old, could be in the new body as it is resurrected in a form or developed into such a time or age that it might be life as long as that? Really, that little baby is not going to be there throughout all of eternity as a little baby. In the wisdom and the plan of God, He's going to take care of that. And yes, I believe that that six-year-old or that little baby or whoever, that one that lived to be a hundred years old, is going to look a little different than they are when they leave this life. But we will recognize who they are. We will know them. You will know your love for them. You will see and you will be able once again to enter the longing, the desire of all of our hearts someday to have that great, grand reunion of those who are gone before us around the throne of God. I've often thought about what is it going to be like someday when we get to heaven, be walking down the streets of gold, and I see this man, and I go up and I introduce myself. And he introduces himself and he says, I'm the Apostle Paul. Oh, what a joy that will be. And I walk to this other man. Who are you? I'm Moses. Oh, that's a thrill beyond my imagination. Who are you? I am Peter. I am David. I am Mary. I am Martha. I have all of these great Bible characters. I look forward to sitting down through all of eternity and being able to experience that wonderful knowledge of who they are. You remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, 
The Bible says that on that mount, Jesus stands there. But who stands there with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I ask you, how did Peter know this was Moses and Elijah? He had never seen them before, but somehow or another, there was a recognition of Moses and Elijah. Paul says, and that's the last bell, so I've got to stop. Paul says that the joy that he had his joy and his crown are those that he has taught the gospel. Philippians chapter 4, my joy and my crown. Someday, when the Lord comes again, Brother David, all of those who taught the gospel and they obeyed the gospel, you will see them. You'll have the joy of knowing them. They will rejoice because they would take and share the gospel with them. And those of you in this audience will say it. You're doing a great work of evangelism and reaching out and trying to save souls. That is Paul's great anticipation. Someday somebody will tap you on the shoulder and you look around. You'll recognize who it is. You'll know who is someone. Boy of my heart, I have walked in the Lord. Yes, someday. Every special person who's gone before us, they will reunite with you the year. Great to be here tonight. It's been a wonderful evening so far. We had a, a super lesson in our boarding class about the certainty of death and the reality of death and about the fact that we're going to know one another in heaven. The most important thing we can take away from that tonight is let's make sure we get there. Let's make sure we get there. Not only let's make sure we get there, but let's make Everybody that we know gets there. But the people that we know that aren't on the right path, that aren't on the right way, we're trying our best to get them on the list. We've got your cards, we can write their names on them. Pray for them every night. Pray for them every night. And when they're ready for a visit or our, our card ministry to start to pass the card, put the name on that card. Everyone go to heaven, so that we can look at them in heaven. John Paul talks about tonight and say, I remember the bill they died. Make sure you can We do have several folks on our prayer list I'd like to bring to memory. Uh, be sure to keep David in your prayers. He's going to keep trial medication and our, our prayers that it works, that it works well. Certainly, I'll say, they do
We remember Terrell Pettis John. He's still at NHS. They want him to seven. He is a prisoner. Continue your prayers. Angela McCauley also. He is uh, under hospital care. He's a prisoner. And then the boys right are coming to the church. We've got a little food card. The prayers are going to be hoping to see that son. I think he's there. Ginger Maxwell also is still recovering. And his body is recovering from her surgery. We've got on his neck. Location number Joel Brumlow.
Thank you. 